Today is Friday, September 17th, 2021, which means it's Derelict Friday. Hello, fiendlings, how the hell are ya? Yesterday, I finished recording the last four chapters of Derelict Trident. I still have to edit well over an hour of raw audio, but the actual voice work appears to be finished. I say that, and then later today I'll discover the files are unusable, because that's how this audiobook is gone. <laughs> But it's almost finished. I still have to get the artwork together, slam the files into an audiobook, and get that puppy out to my $10 Patreon patrons before I even begin the process of getting it into stores. Still, getting the audio done is a major, major step in being finally finished with this novel. Want to know what is finished and ready to land on your Kindle reader? The Derelict Trident ebook is available right now from Amazon. If you don't want to wait another five or six weeks to find out how things end, Feel free to click on the link in the show notes, purchase that ebook for $4.99, and get reading. Purchasing the ebook and reviewing all four books in the saga helps other folks find the series and can also put some change in my pocket. So, you know, consider doing that. As soon as I finish up this morning's podcasting chores, it'll be time to go over the files for the paperback. Yes, there will be a paperback. I might even autograph a few for those interested. Ah, more things that will have to wait until October. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode 41 of Derelict Trident. Chapter 69 A whole seam across from Dickerson bucked and split. Shit! he yelled, and Calimora immediately turned. Before she could raise her rifle to point, the deck plate floated free, its trajectory taking it just a meter from their heads. Maybe a dozen orbs followed in its wake, their surfaces glittering and rippling as if they weren't quite there. Dickerson didn't have time to figure out if they were friend or foe before one of them unfolded in front of Calimora like an umbrella. Two more took their place around Dickerson, and even more followed suit. Now he couldn't see a damn thing except for Calimora who was facing him and the heaving, shivering surfaces of some strange metal around them. When the corporal spoke, she sounded winded. What the fuck? She wasn't the only one panting. My question, too, he said. The metal creatures surrounding them drifted for an instant, as if pushed. The spire, to which they were still attached, wrenched violently. Dickerson thought he'd be torn to pieces if their metal guardians, or perhaps jailers, didn't move with it. The things swayed with their human charges, their positions changed only by centimeters. I think they're friendlies, he said. Why? He shrugged. Otherwise, we'd be dead. Got a feeling whatever the void that was that hit the station would have torn us apart. Point, she said. The vibration disappeared, but he saw their metal guards' bodies jolt as if struck repeatedly. Dickerson's stomach lurched and he groaned. We're spinning! Another jolt, and the G's increased in nauseating ways. Whatever hit them had spun them like a centrifuge, but they kept getting knocked in different directions. Kelly Moore whimpered over the radio, or maybe it was him. They could see nothing but their visors reflected by their suit lights, no sense of motion for their eyes to combine with the blood rushing through their brains and the press on their bodies. A semi-transparent ripple floated between them, Kelly Moore's body shimmering as the wave passed through her. Dickerson, you, uh... Yeah, you too, he said. The G-forces leveled off. The sensation they were rolling through space dissipated. The nausea that had been threatening to burst every liter of liquid from his body slowly followed. We alive? Kelly Moore asked. No fucking idea, Dickerson said. One of the metallic creatures floated upward from its position above Kelly Moore and turned. The others followed, floating away as if on invisible tethers. Dickerson blinked. They were no longer attached to Trident Station. He and Kelly Mora were locked onto a clamp that used to be attached to the station. As discomforting as that was, he hardly noticed. He was too busy watching the fireworks. SNR Black vibrated hard, and although Oakes had completely decompressed the ship, Dunn swore he heard deck plates rattling, but that could have just been his teeth. The cam feeds showed the massive med bay ship 20 meters from their aft, the space between them glittering and shimmering, slow translucent waves pushing outward from the med bay's fore. 
Behind Noble's new ride, thousands of exosolar creatures were giving chase. Dunn had no idea of their speed, but considering how quickly the remains of Trident Station were fading into the shroud, Noble had to be pushing them damned fast, yet there were no G's of acceleration. How? Black, how fast are we traveling? Unknown. My sensors are no longer functioning properly. Like they weren't made for this? Precisely. Although Blue is still accelerating, we are rapidly catching up to her. Threats? His cam feeds converged into a single panoramic feed taken from... Is that from the shipyards? Yes, I believe so. The cam feed showed Trident Station in ruins, the spire's framework all that remained, thousands of Atmos steel plates floating near it like a disassembled suit of armor. Miniature asteroid belts of creature debris orbited this station, the shroud surrounding the area fading away as though it had never been there. Noble's ship pushed the massive QM bays and SNR Black through the pierced shroud and toward open space. Following in their wake was complete darkness. What does that mean? I don't know, sir. Don, this is LeBlanc. Her voice sounded as though she were speaking while in a laundry machine. Copy. Go, Dunn said. We are redlined for non-stasis acceleration. Lou has the orders in case we pass out. Do you have time for... We move from our couches now, we die. No stasis possible. But Eric, what are we doing? He hissed through his teeth. We're going to blow these fuckers back to where they came from, I hope. You hope? He nodded, although she couldn't see him. I'm only doing what I'm told, following orders. Whose? He could almost hear G snickering. Blue was still accelerating, but at this rate, with help from the new ship... SNR Black and the QM modules were going to catch up to the other SNR ship in less than two minutes. The hangar bay modules, empty apart from the infrastructure and whatever the trio had decided to include, had less than a quarter of the mass of the densely packed QM bay modules. Sir? Noble said over the comms. Dunn answered him immediately. Go. The QM bay is getting really hot. Black checked her hull temperature. Noble was right. The QM bays below her were quickly heating up. If the rate continued unabated, the Atmos steel plates would soon reach their melting point. Noble, thanks for the push. Time for you to look for survivors. Sir, I... Do it now. Aye, sir, Noble said. The translucent field around the medbay ship rippled brightly before disappearing. Noble's craft veered off before quickly vanishing behind them. Black? Yes, Captain. How long before whatever happens, happens? I don't know, sir. However, the QM bays will melt in less than three minutes. Oaks, Dunn called out. We have to catch up. Now. Give me whatever you can. Oaks lay in the instructions and Black double-checked them. Without asking him or telling him she was going to do it, Black added 73 step corrections to ensure a smoother burn cycle. Less torture for her human charges. On the internal cams, she watched Dunn clamp himself to a hull plate parallel to the engine array. Oaks had suited up long ago, his helmet donned and visor down, the acceleration couch ready to keep him in place. In three, Oaks started the countdown. Black ran every engineering check she could manage. She scoured the instruments, testing, exploring, looking for damage from the battle. Hull integrity, 62%, out thrusters at 70%, Negative vector thrusters at 12% operation. Two. New weapons, new missiles, yet they fit in hers and Blue's racks, obeyed their commands as if their weapons themselves had been designed for SNR ships and their support vehicles. An upgrade to their... Black brought up all of her available systems, counted 49 new available sensors, and 55 separate control interfaces. Black stretched her personality across the new pathways and command structures. It was as if a mental knot, one she hadn't known existed, had been untied. One. The two SNR sentients contacted one another simultaneously, exchanged information, compared, and understood. It was a binary decision. They either committed mutiny and faced destruction, or followed orders and ensured their crew's destruction. Oaks tapped the panel, and nothing happened. Wait, what? Oaks said, and hit the panel again. Flight program disabled flashed across his hollow display. Black, what 
the fuck is going on? Lieutenant, she said in a calm voice, please trust me. The grav plate beneath the pilot's couch came to life. In the briefing room, the one beneath Dunn came to life as well. She saw each of the men sag as if suddenly pressed upon. Black, what? the captain asked. Trust me, Black said to him. The gravitic generator in reactor cell 3, the one Noble had blamed for the radiation leak, came to life. The hull plates, the very ones the engineer had used to track the creatures below the hull, glowed and rippled. The spindle connecting the module bays to black, the ones the marines had fought to secure, glowed as well. The gravitic waves traveling along the spine of the connected modules and forming a bubble that surrounded the ship and its charge. Ahead of black, an identical bubble formed around blue. The two ships engaged their newfound propulsion systems and smoothly accelerated. The swarms of creatures, so many that the humans couldn't count, coalesced with the giant leviathans hiding in the shadows. Neptune's blue glow dimmed as if the amorphous cloud of utter darkness was eating every photon. A moment later, the shroud followed the two ships, its acceleration matching that of its prey. Chapter 70 Talby maneuvered the SV through a clutter of shredded atmo and the detritus of exosolar corpses. The craft's armored belly was nearly down to the last layer of steel, the bow at 20% integrity, and a left thruster no longer functioned because it was missing. Copenhaver's turret had taken several massive hits, but the creatures hadn't yet broken through. He heard the sounds of Marines yelling for support. His HUD lit up with the survival beacons of five Marines. They'd either been forced to jettison their skiffs or had been ripped from them. One of Blue's SVs, the one not flown by Lieutenant James, had already been rendered helpless by swarms of starfish and pine cones. The survival beacons for both the pilot and gunner hadn't lasted but a few seconds after that. Black was gone, and so was the shroud, but the creatures continued approaching from all directions, maybe attracted by Neptune's light now that their purpose had been lost. It didn't matter. Their plan to get the bays away from Neptune seemed to have worked. He'd have to be satisfied with that because this was a losing battle. Everyone was out of ammunition, and he and the remaining SV could only try and lead the creatures away from the stranded marines. Shit! Copenhaver yelled. We lost another one! Four survival beacons now. In a moment or two, that might go down to zero. What can we do? He yelled and flipped the vehicle to face the nearest beacon. A pine cone crashed against the canopy and rattled the steel around him. A new alarm flashed on his HUD. A four-thruster was gone. Another nail in the coffin that was his maneuverability. Copenhaver muttered to herself, no doubt checking over the SV's functions. Um, I can lower the containment on the reactor, she said. Do it. Give the fuckers something to chase. Aye, sir. An instant later, another alert appeared. Self-destruction sequence activated. Telby gulped. That's not what you meant to hit. When she spoke again, she sounded amused. Yes, it is, sir. His HUD flashed again. Self-destruction paused. Reactor containment at 40%. Immediately, the creatures that had been flying past him began to decelerate and turn. Talby's face lit with a savage grin as he punched the aft and port thrusters, the craft shooting forward and laterally in response. He only had three working cams left, but there were enough to know the trick had worked. More shapes were heading his way or decelerating to turn around. Lieutenant James, Copenhaver said over the comms. Start the self-destruction sequence and pause it. It'll weaken the reactor containment and leave a trail for the bastards. Talby barely noticed that the other pilot had replied. A herd of pine cones, looking like misshapen balloons, their silver talons facing him, approached from the starboard side. He waited until the last second and fired all the thrusters on that side, the craft sliding away. Most of the pine cones filled the empty space where he'd just been, but a few slammed into the armor, eliciting more alarms. Lost another starboard thruster, Copenhaver said. No shit, Talby said. Three more herds of the oblong creatures were racing toward the SV's belly and aft. He didn't have much of a prayer of dodging all of them. It was a tightening noose. Talby, Lieutenant James called out. I've got... Her transmission went dead, and the SV's icon disappeared from his HUD. 
a new survival beacon appeared in its place. He cursed, rolled the SV over, and pushed the belly thrusters to full. The SV shot at a negative vector to the incoming pine cones and starfish. The horde of creatures moved past and above them. Talby activated the starboard thrusters, the three that still worked, and rotated the SV at the same moment. Facing Trident once more, he accelerated and headed to the other side of the station, the creatures following in his wake. By leading the creatures away from the stranded, floating, helpless marines, he would at least give them a shot. Maybe they'd get picked up by someone, if there was anyone left to save them. At least he wouldn't have their deaths on his conscience. He'd done the best he could. Sir, they're gaining, Copenhaver said. Talby didn't respond. He'd seen the rear cam feed. He'd seen the hundreds of starfish and pine cones and something he couldn't even describe trailing them. They were catching up, sure, but he wasn't at full power yet. He could wait a few moments. Scratch that. A few seconds. A spray of silver liquid arced through space and spattered against the aft. Integrity warnings chimed. Talby ground his teeth and opened the throttle another notch. The horde behind him fell back immediately, but quickly accelerated to catch up. Can't shake them, he said softly. Going to have to try something else. Private, how do you feel about blowing this thing up and taking a few hundred of them with us? She was silent for a moment. Are we going to a check first? Yes, Talby said with a shrug. That's the plan, anyway. I have a rifle, several mags, and a few grenades, sir, she said. Not sure who left them for me, but I'm ready for a fight. Same here, Talby said. I think they prepacked the SV for us. I figure two of us together is safer than a single Marine floating out in space. Copy, sir. Talby touched the throttle again. The creatures fell back once more before matching his speed. The exo-things, so many of them that they had formed their own mini-shroud behind him, had become little more than vague shapes against the backdrop of space. Even Neptune's blue glow had dimmed to the point he barely noticed it. Set a timer on that self-destruct, he said. We want about 30 seconds. Safe distance? She said. Talby shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine. Aye, sir. Copenhaver sounded helpless, and he didn't blame her. Best we can do, Private, unless you have a better idea. No, sir, I don't. She said quickly. He nodded. He wasn't expecting an argument with her over this, and thankfully there wasn't going to be one. He sensed she had made a decision. She'd die fighting. Good. He'd die right beside her, firing his weapons until he was out of ammo. He'd die swinging a vibroblade, if it came to that. Get ready to eject, he said, and get ready to fight. Copy that, sir, Copenhaver said, a bit of steel back in her voice. He studied the available camera feeds before rolling the craft and opening the conventional throttle as far as he dared. Ready? Aye, sir. He waited a beat just to make sure he had the angle right. This isn't going to work, he told himself, but it's all I've got. Now! The canopy shot outward from the SV as if fired from a cannon. An instant later, the rockets beneath their seats came to life and ejected both of them from the fuselage, protective translucent bubbles encasing the two humans. The two bubbles rocketed away while the SV continued on, its remaining belly and aft thrusters jammed to full. Talby's bubble streaked into a cloud of starfish. Two or three clipped the protective barrier and sent Talby spinning off into the darkness. As the universe tumbled around him, he made out flashes of ghoulish things moving through the shadowy shroud, one of them ripping through the bubble and the shoulder of his suit either by accident or in an attempt to snatch him. The combat suit self-patched, but the rake had decompressed his atmosphere for a brief moment. His mind felt as though it were being squeezed by an invisible fist, the horrors around him shimmering with unreality. The suit's life support re-established and his lungs filled with precious air. He closed his eyes, his mouth open in a silent scream. Then the vibrations and rattles ceased. He opened his eyes warily and found himself still spinning, but now he was in open space, the massive nest of shimmering shadows melting into the darkness. Talby adjusted the seat's maneuvering jets to stabilize himself. Just as he did, his visor went completely black. When it cleared, his brain froze. 
The SV had destroyed itself, taking the cloud of shadows with it. Space shimmered and rippled, just as it had at red, but this was so much larger. The detonation must have triggered something else. He gritted his teeth while he waited for a new horde of creatures to appear, but none did. He checked for Copenhaver's beacon. From his perspective, she was already more than three kilometers away. She'd either been knocked off course by the creatures as he had, or maybe she'd managed to make it through without issue. Copenhaver? He called out over the comms. She didn't respond. Interference? He checked his suit's rad count. The space around them was still near the red line, possibly affecting the comms. After checking the remaining thruster fuel of his flight chair, he changed its rotation, led the beacon to compensate for Copenhaver's trajectory, and fired the thrusters. The remaining fuel didn't last more than 10 seconds, but it was enough to push him in the direction where her beacon should be in less than a minute. If he'd miscalculated, he had enough thruster fuel to adjust his trajectory. At least, that was the theory. Once he was less than a kilometer away, he unstrapped from the chair, activated his suit thrusters, and sped away from what had served as an escape bubble. With her position outlined on his HUD, he continued adjusting the thrusters until he could see her body through his visor. She floated limply in space, her arms outstretched and motionless. Private? Tommy called again. He quickly scanned through the menus and found her suit telemetry. She had oxygen and power, but her vitals were low. Cursing, he continued adjusting until he met her suit and wrapped his arms around her shoulders as gently as he could to cushion the blow. He still hit her too fast, making him wince, but there was nothing for it. She was dying inside the suit. Then he saw the massive dent in her helmet, the cracks auto-sealed, but the damage obvious. Her skull was probably fractured, maybe in more than one place. It was impossible to tell whether or not she was bleeding out. Talby activated his distress beacon, hoping there was still someone near Trident Station that could help. He didn't have enough fuel to get them back to what remained of the structure, and there was no redoubt there anyway. All he could do was hold on to his gunner and hope help arrived soon. A shroud had all but disappeared, leaving them bathed in Neptune's deep blue light. Kelly scanned in all directions, her visor set to look for targets. Not that she or Dickerson could do much to fend off an attack. The majority of the starfish and even the larger creatures had swarmed together and accelerated away in Black's wake. Whatever stragglers hadn't made the journey had already reformed, and if Kali was right, they were pissed. Off in the distance, lights flashed in a rhythmic bursts. Rifle fire or turret fire. Probably marines battling near Trident's spine. She wondered how long they could hold out. After what had happened to the atmosteel plating surrounding the spire and the fact that only the massively damaged habitation modules remained, it didn't look as though there was anywhere to retreat to, nowhere to refuel, and nowhere to rearm. Comms established flashed across her HUD. Need of assistance. Again, this is Lieutenant Noble of Black Company. Does anyone read? Are there any survivors? Lieutenant, this is Callie Mora. Over. Noble ignored her and repeated the message again the verbiage changing a bit, with a pause now and then between bursts, but the lieutenant obviously couldn't hear her. No dice here either, Corporal. Our LR transmitters are done. She nodded. Probably right. Without my block, I can't check shit. Block? When did they stop working? She shrugged. I guess around the time we got pulled from the station? I don't know. Dickerson pointed at Trident and the strobing patterns of light. Do you think they're ours or blues? Does it matter? Kelly asked. Not really. He sighed. Corporal, I'm fucking tired. Tired, yes, she thought. But also sick to my stomach. She thought there was a good chance they'd each suffered lethal doses of radiation before they'd escaped Trident. Extra shielding or not, the emergency radiation suits hadn't exactly fit either of them perfectly, and one chink in the armor had probably been enough. Yes, Kelly said with a chuckle. Very tired. When Dickerson spoke again, she knew he'd come to the same conclusion she had. You know, that drink? I'm really going to miss that we never had it. Me too, she said. He turned to look at the planet below. Never going to get over that view. Half the reason I came here. 
What was the other half? Kelly asked. He snorted. Decking an asshole on Scaparelli. Fucker had it coming, but this was the only place that would have me. Wait, why weren't you kicked out? He turned back to her and she could tell he was smiling beneath the visor. The asshole I hit testified at my court-martial. After his testimony, they kicked my ass off Mars, but not out of the core. This seemed as good a place as any. Sure as Void wasn't going back to Earth. Besides, same guy I hit? Same guy that testified? That same asshole recruited me to come here. Kelly blinked again. What? Who? Dickerson paused a few seconds before answering her. Gunny Cartwright. The last word came out choked. She felt as though she'd been struck because the name immediately brought feelings of loss. She didn't know for sure he was dead, and yet somehow she did. Recruited me, too, she said quietly. Dickerson didn't look at her, but he stiffened slightly. I figured. Carb, too. He said nothing for a moment, and then giggled. Fucker. Guess he really was trying to get back at me for that sucker punch. Have to tell me about it sometime, Kelly said. She coughed, and a wad of phlegm stuck to her inner visor. After another bout of coughing, one which she kept her mouth shut for, she swallowed back hard chunks of mucus. Corporal? Yeah, next time I'll mute myself. I'd appreciate it, Dickerson said. He was wheezing, and she didn't like the sound of it. Noble's message repeated over the comms. Kelly tried once more to respond, but she got nothing. Yep, they were fucked. The pair of them, or rather, their suited corpses, would remain affixed to this hunk of steel until their suits ran out of power. When the maglocks released, it was only a matter of time before particles slowed them, made them drift away into a death spiral orbit around Neptune. They'd fall into its atmosphere and become one with the planet. She closed her eyes and tried to imagine herself standing on the Martian surface wearing nothing more than a simple jumpsuit, breathing a normal atmosphere and watching forests bloom from a hydrated, re-engineered Mars. Just like in some of her dreams. In her nightmares, she often found herself outside her dome wearing nothing at all while a horrific sandstorm stripped the flesh from her bones and she asphyxiated. What would it be like to fall into Neptune and its frozen atmosphere? Would she just fall asleep, or... She had another coughing fit, managed to mute herself this time, and wished she could wipe her lip. Foolish, she thought. You'll be dead long before you feel what Neptune has in store for you. Her thoughts continued spiraling, different images and memories overlapping and fragmenting at the same time. She opened her eyes, blinked hard, and tried to push the thoughts away. There was really only one that mattered anyway. It was nearly time to say goodbye to the universe. The lights near Trident had all but disappeared, the flashes infrequent and scattered. The Marines were likely running out of ammo, literally down the fighting with vibroblades in their rifle stocks. She wheezed a sigh, her chest rattling as if it was filled with shrapnel. At least those Marines would die fighting. <laughs>